Good afternoon everybody, welcome to our Q&A about the French canals. This hopefully will be useful for you if you are planning on the French canals either with your own boat or chartering. Two parts, first part is the practicalities of it in a sailboat and some of the pros and cons. Second part is our favourites, our highlights and other questions. All these questions were put to us by our patrons, so thank you to all of them who submitted questions. Hopefully this will be a really good aid for you if this is something that you're considering doing, because we could find very little information when we started our research. Yeah. We did obviously turn to Paul and Cheryl Shard from Distant Shores, lots of information on the internet from blogs, but actual kind of like the nitty gritty stuff, couldn't find much. Anyway, hope you find this useful, enjoy. question one and who's given the question so the we of course we turn to our patrons for uh, the questions because they always ask us like the best questions that I would never have thought of myself so let's start with the questions pertaining to the practicalities of the French canals so uh, David and Rodney asked a very similar question which uh, had to do with whether you can get catamaran through the canals and also what is the draft and the uh, width and also the air draft in the canals. So what are the dimensions that we're working with? You have no idea, do you? <laughs> I do, I do. You drummed it into me. Uh, and, and I could see those bridges heading towards us. All right, well, so let's deal with draft. Yeah. Uh, draft is meant to be 1.5 metres. Yeah. 1.5 metres. In, in the canal du Midi. In the canal du Midi. And let me, sorry, before we get into that, let me just say that this, the, these um, dimensions are just for the canal du Midi and the Canal de Garonne, which are the two canals that we went through, and there are different dimensions in different canals within yep. France and the rest of Europe. So, okay. yeah, carry on. So, 1.5 metres, which yeah. in Imperial is three, four and a half foot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so four, uh -huh. four foot, six inches. Um, we found this to be a very kind of like liberal uh, <laughs> approximation of depth. We found that in lots of places that depth was, it was a lot, it was a, less. a lot less. Mm. Um, we found that the depth uh, became reduced quite considerably as you got closer to the banks of the canals. Yes. And also in many areas after the locks where obviously the sluice should let lots of debris through, there were, there were mounds yeah. of, uh, of debris. We draw, um, well, it's meant to be 60 centimetres under the hull. So probably about a metre, a metre, and we dragged in yeah. part. We dragged a lot in parts. Um, once or twice, we just couldn't get the, the boat close to the, the canal banks. Mm. So there are parts where you, you, you're just not going to get close. Yeah. And it's not so much the keel, but the rudder, I think, as well. Well, we, had, we have twin rudders. Yeah. So that was an issue particular to our yeah. boat. Yeah. But um, overall, we had plenty of water. We we only dragged a few times, and because the the um, bottom is so soft, it's just like debris and mud. You can just plow through it. Yeah, it's not it's not thick. It's not like hitting a sandbank. Yeah. You, you literally you're just, you're slowed down, and you and you can see that you're churning material up. Yeah. I would consider that it, really if you have a draft of one to one point two meters, you're about you're gonna be alright. Yeah. But I think past that, once you're looking at five foot keels, you're going to have to struggle in parts. Yeah. Especially in the height of summer where the canal water levels have dropped slightly. Slightly. Evaporation apparently. and things like yeah. that. Yeah. So width, canal width. Do you remember what the canal width is? I think it's five meters. Yeah, it's about five meters. That's 15 foot. Um, and so you are looking, that, that's to do with, really the, the locks are probably at the very least eight meters wide. That's enough for once two. Once you're in. Once you're in. Yeah. So the lock gates are four meters, five meters. Five meters. About five meters. Um, and once you're inside, they're about they go out to about eight meters. So you can get boats side by side. Yeah. Um, it's tight though, and the thing about the width of the the bridges and the locks is that, especially some of the bridges, you don't go at them 
straight. Sometimes there's, there's probably half a dozen bridges where they're, they're on a curve mm. or they're around a bend and you've really got to line yourself up yeah. carefully before yeah. kind of passing underneath them or through them. So speaking of bridges, um, let's talk about the bridge height because this was our major concern going in because we knew that we had enough, we were narrow enough and we knew with our lift kill that we didn't have to worry about yep. water depth, but the bridge height was a major concern major. of ours. Okay, so the the books that you can buy anywhere along the canals or before you get in, they're called fluvi carts, flu, they navigate. Yeah. They're, so they're, they're like uh, they're guidebooks, um, pilot books for the canals. They will give you the heights, the minimum heights of all the bridges you need to go under. Yeah. In a nutshell, the, the lowest bridge I think was 3 meters 25, so yeah. that is about 12 foot. I don't know why you keep looking at me, I have no and idea. 10 foot, it's about 10 foot. No, because Americans would like yeah, to Yeah, well know we can, we can look in, it up and put it on the they screen. They work in kind of prehistoric, Instead of you kind of like right, taking fine. time. So, so yeah, about, it says 3 meters 25. That in itself isn't a problem because we were able to do the calculations for the the height of our mast above the waterline. The problem is that it's to do with how the spans of the bridge work. If, for instance, you've got a bridge that goes completely, it's five meters uh, wide, but you've got the, 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 the span and the arch of the bridge is completely flat and completely perpendicular to the water, it's three meters 25 all the way across. Yeah. However, if you've got an older bridge which has got arches, the height drops really rapidly. Yeah, that the, the height is obviously only at the apex yeah. of the bridge, so the sides are a lot lower. Yes. And um, because we have, uh, our main issue was our bimini. Our bimini was the highest point of our boat, and our bimini is quite square in shape. So we were worried about the, yep. the size of the bimini scraping, and yeah, we came pretty close. Well, uh, one, there was one bridge in Cacasson, we actually took the bimini off. So this, the lowest bridge, which is 3 metres 30 or 3 metres 25, we took the bimini off because we were worried. Yeah, it was also because it had a real kind of like narrow span. Yeah. It, the, the arch was quite pronounced, and yeah. so we would have hit the sides of the bimini. I mean, I, literally, you're, you're looking at it going, oh, we're going to hit something. <laughs> but no, it, it worked out, so yeah. no damage to no damage to the boat, really. Um, so, uh, it's perfectly navigable if you draw I would say you know if you've got a keel that's five foot or less mm -hmm. I would say and uh, less than your boat is less than four meters in, in in width and if you can keep the height of everything around the three meter mark you'll be you'll be fine yeah yeah okay so Jessica Williams uh, has the next question and Jessica you asked a lot of really fantastic questions so your your name is going to come up again later in this episode um, but in terms of uh, practicalities you want to know about canal etiquette and your other question was about the fees so let's talk about the fees first how much you have to buy a license in order to do yep. the canals um, and how much was that um, we paid 144 euros for one month um, it is less if you buy a 12 month permit. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's obviously that stat, you know, the payments are, are less if you buy the 12 months. So 144 euros, not a great amount no. for the license to get into the canals. We held our license um, in digital copy. We just had a screenshot on an iPad. Um, and you it, can do it all online. Yeah, it, it, it is really easy, literally. Yeah. It, there's, there's no jiggery pokery to it. You just get in there, uh, pay for it, and then just keep your hard copy. Uh, and we were stopped. We were stopped once inside a lock, and uh, the, the ecclesia came and said, I need to see your, your license, which we duly had. Mm -hmm. um, they are quite strict about it, and I think, uh, anecdotally, there are some quite heavy fines if you do not pay or you try to, if you get caught. Uh, and they've got you because you're in a lock. So, um, <laughs> There's no running away. So that's what they, that was the fees um, for entry into the canals. Mm -hmm. um, ongoing fees, we actually found the canals to be considerably cheaper mm. than sea-based marinas. Yes. So um, what I think the most we spent on a marina was, or for a, a mooring was, I think, 20, 22 euros a night. I think Bezier was dearest, and that was... Um, 20 night. 20 a night, 20 yeah. Night. And that included electricity and water. Yeah. So, um, and that's for, well, it's a 12 meter boat with a 16 meter mast on deck, but you know, our papers say 12 meters. Mm. So, um, yeah, it was 20 euros a night, um, which is probably 50 to 100% less than we're paying in the marinas the other side yeah. once you get through. So, uh, at the, at the highest cost, 20 euros. Mm -hmm. um, the other end of the spectrum, free, completely free. Mm -hmm. um, if you take the the kind of nature moorings where you kind of like use ground stakes or a lot of bollards that are put in place along the way, yeah, um, they cost nothing. Yeah, um, and then from there we had euros, uh, two euros a night, 
Um, a, a lot of them were free, but you had to pay for electricity. Which was two euros a night. Yeah, or in, in one case it was a euro for four hours. Yeah. And you can, there's a lot of these kind of self-dispensing machines where you can put um, your credit card in and it gives you these little like tokens. tokens. Um, to put into the machines as you go along um, so it's all self-service so that there's no there's no human operation there all I would say is that those coins every single machine has a different shaped coin and so you can't take and load up the canals uh, we made that mistake we never we had literally by the end of it we had six or seven different coins yeah of different with different grooves in none of them fitted so don't think you can carry them up the canals that's one thing we learned um, through trying and error <laughs> And canal etiquette. So there are rules of the road um, when doing the canals, and you actually need to have a special. Would you call it a license? The, yes, um, yeah, yeah. You yeah. Need, so you talk need. about you did that. Yeah. So the license, um, you you have to. The, we did the license online. It's it's a it's an online test. Um, there's two parts to it. Most of it. It's just basic navigation. If you sail a boat, you will. You. It's it's fairly straightforward. I did yeah. it in a day, uh, and you were given a, a, a digital certificate. Um, I also changed my ICC over to inland waterways, but I, no one asked for any qualifications uh, at all. However, I would, it, it is always nice to know that you kind of understand the rules of the road and heaven forbid, should you end up in an accident and you don't have the certification, um, they will throw the book at you. Mm -hmm. So uh, etiquette, we always tend to let idiots go in first. <laughs> I think that's a good way of doing it. And there are a lot of people on those canals I, I don't think I've ever seen such dangerous boating anywhere in my entire career as I have on those canals. Yeah. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. We'll, 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 there are questions about, about the high boat situation. So there are, there are a lot of people there who have never been in charge of a boat, mm -hmm. have no formal qualifications, are not required to have formal qualifications to rent a boat, mm -hmm. and use the adage that there is nothing that can't be fixed by applying full throttle to any situation so be aware there are some fools some damn fools on those canalways and there were many times where uh it came close to confrontation actually i'm not gonna lie i you know it, it, there were there were times when i got to the point where i almost jumped boat with a pickaxe handle we'll cut this out <laughs> <laughs> see how I feel on the day. Well, I'll explain that to you because I think it's going it's coming. Yeah? Well, let's, as I said, well, um, there's questions about the high boat situation, okay, so fine. we'll come on to that in a minute, and you can you can take that opportunity to decide yes, yes. In ex exactly how much detail you want to go into. Uh, so yes, there is canal etiquette, but you learn it all through the license that you have to do, yep. um, and we talked about the fees. So Ian uh, would like to know whether the locks are automated. In, in France and the short answer is yes however the Canal du Midi is an exception and that's because it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site it was I believe the first canal in France to be built and that was in six in the 1680s which just seems amazing that they were able to, to build such an incredible um, uh, I guess engineering structure you want to see the pyramids babe <laughs> <laughs> It's all right then. I'm not saying that there's not like lots of impressive things that were built back in the day, but no, nonetheless, um, the Canal du Midi was was the first canal in France to be built, and it was in the um, 1680s. So, as such, they have listed it as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and you cannot therefore touch it or modernise it or change it in any way. So that was all. Um, that was all manned, all the locks were manned and they were they were operated by the Ecclesier, the lock keeper. But I think almost every other canal in France, and certainly the Garonne, which is the other canal that we did, is all automated. So the way that the automated locks work, and you would have seen this in our episodes, so um, I'll link uh, I'll link to a relevant episode. Is it going to be on this side of the screen? Or you'll, it, it'll be up here somewhere. I'll link to a relevant episode so you can see it in more detail. But essentially there is like a pole that's suspended above the canal as you approach the lock. And so the idea is that you kind of negotiate the boat so that you go past the pole and one of you twists it. And the twisting activates the lock so that uh, it is the, the water level is, is um, at the correct level for whatever side you're entering it on. 
and then the lock gates open and you go in and you tie up and then at the point where you're ready you have to push a button on there's like a little control panel it's very simple there's literally a green button for go and then a red button for stop um, if you have an emergency so you press the green button and the rest of it is all done for you and then the, go the gates open by themselves at the um, once the water has gone up or down depending on which direction you're going in so the automated locks were really easy actually um, and I think that the twisty pole thing is I think that's the case almost throughout the throughout France I think that yeah 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 yet, yet to be uh, well um, Paul and Cheryl did the locks as well so Paul and Cheryl from Distant Shores if you are watching this and please let me know if that was the case um, further north in France um, okay so Bob has the next question which uh, again pertains to practicalities on the canals and he would like to know about the speed limit and he also wants to know about uh, how we tied up every evening were there kind of anchorages um, or did we have to tie up to a wall um, and also what are the hours of, of operation in the locks so let's um, let's go backwards so the hours that the locks are open are between 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. So, and they're usually closed for lunch. They're always closed for lunch. Yeah. 12 till 1, they close. Even the automated locks close, yeah. which we found out when we were in a lock <laughs> once. <laughs> <laughs> we managed to get in and then it wouldn't work and yeah. we realised it was lunchtime. And a seriously pissed off Ecclesiastes to turn up with his baguette <laughs> half in hand and a bottle of wine. Like, and he, yeah, he was not happy. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, 9 till 7. And, um, the speed limit is eight kilometers an hour. It works in kilometers, the canals. So in terms of where we tied up every night, we've already touched yep. on this. Nick, why don't you pick that up? Well, you can take, uh, there's, there are a lot, a, a, a huge amount of moorings that you can, you can pay, take up uh, in villages and they're normally serviced with electricity and water. They normally have bollards and dock walls that have uh, good depth mm. up until the dock wall. And we found that we traveled through in, in June. Uh, we never, struggled to find uh, a mooring no we never there was one exception where i think if we'd got there after 5 p.m we wouldn't have got a mooring but generally where, where, are, you thinking, where are you thinking of that place where all those boats turned up was it brown oh yeah yeah that's true but so generally you can find a mooring everywhere um the higher boats don't have gen sets and therefore are very reliant on shore power um, so they can't, they, and I think they do that obviously to stop people blowing the boats up and also so that they, they the, the higher boats tend to go to places that are serviced. Yeah, and they also tend to go to other bases. Yeah, because So there'll be here, yeah. a, a, base, a base here and then 20 kilometres down there yes. can now there'll be another base. So they tend to go between the bases. So, yeah. Um, and then the nature moorings. You can moor almost everywhere. There are very few areas you can't moor and they are clearly signposted. It says no mooring between, with first 600 metres or 800 metres or whatever. Uh, and you literally just approach the bank. You need to make sure that there's no debris in the water, no roots in the water. And then normally we would nose the boat, the nose of the boat into, into, the, um, into the bank. Therese would jump off and you know, you, you just you use ground stakes. We bought some fairly heavy duty uh, tent pegs, but they were big. I mean like they're 14 inches long They weren't good enough. Then we ended up uh, buying some fork handles um, and they worked once they'd been sharpened and then we found some kind of like metal rods and They've just got to be tamped in with a mallet um, You can't tie up to trees if you tie up to a tree they do find you um, and it, It's not it's beautiful. It is beautiful out there. Yeah. You know, you're very self-sufficient There's lots of shops along the way to provision So spending a couple of three nights just in the middle of nowhere not seeing another boat is a real spectacle It's a lovely yeah. thing to do. Yeah, yeah Okay, so the next question uh, Both Stuart and Robert had a very similar question So I've put them together and again, it goes on from what we we're just talking about uh, Which is how was the availability of fresh water pump out facilities uh, baguettes, etc. How available was stuff on shore? Um, such as supplies and whatnot. So we've already touched on that. Um, everything was very readily available and I'll add uh, diesel and pump out facilities to that list as well. There um, wasn't a lot of pump out facilities. No, but the pump out facilities and uh, where you can get diesel, they're clearly marked on your guidebooks. Yeah. So you can plan quite well in advance where to go to if you need diesel, mm -hmm. if you need to um, ha you know, get your, your holding tank pumped out. Um, so, Yes, everything was very 
available, very readily available. I would say that our bikes came in handy a lot because we were able to access the larger supermarkets, which yep. are usually situated just outside of town. Um, however, if you don't have bikes and you've just got your own two feet, then everything's so easy to get to. The towpaths along the canals, obviously back in the day before engines, they used horses to drag the boats or the barges along the canal. So there is a towpath there for that purpose. And they've been converted now into either just walking trails or bike paths. So it's easy enough to walk up and down the canals um, if you need to. And everything, I mean, it's France. It's not, you know, the middle of the desert. It's, it's, there are villages every few miles and every village has somewhere to buy a baguette, um, somewhere to buy a bottle of wine, and usually somewhere to buy some cheese and fresh fruit and whatnot as well. So everything was very easily accessible. Yep, absolutely. Right, so the next question is a question I'm very glad that was asked because um, this was our major uh, kind of consideration before going into the canals, which uh, was asked by Simon. And he wants to know about the mast. The mast was a big deal. It was a big deal. Uh, so he wants to know about the pros and cons of carrying it on deck um, and or versus transporting it by road and whether the overhang posed any difficulties. Nick. Okay, so let's just deal with transporting it by road. There are one or two companies that can transport. Fastmast is one of them, and there's another one, I can't remember who it was. They were unable to transport our mast. We were in contact with them, and they are really good. I think he's a, he's a chap's a German, but he's very, you know, his English is fantastic. Um, but literally, they came back to us a week beforehand and said, look, we can't do it now. We've got a special order job up in Denmark, and we've only got, you know, we, we can't get there for three weeks. So that... You know, that for us meant either staying in the Mediterranean for three weeks or, or doing our own mast. So very short notice, uh, we had to decide to carry our own mast. And I would say that there is a limit to the length of mast they can carry. So I know that Paul and Cheryl, when they tried to use a fast mast, their mast was over the length that they could take. Mm. So just check with them beforehand, well beforehand. But overall, I found the, the service of fast mast to be good. You know, yeah. apart from the fact they couldn't actually transport mm -hmm. our mast, all the communication was efficient. Yeah. And, and by the way, they quoted us a thousand euros to, yeah. to transport. So it's about a thousand euros. Yeah. The downsides to that is obviously you have to leave your mast in the hands of someone and expect them to transport it to somewhere and receive it. And then put it up on. Um, uh, yeah, in a safe place. or something somewhere safe. So the two places that we went to, one was Priac um, for. On the Atlantic side. On the Atlantic side and. Um, Chant Chantier Alamar on the Mediterranean side. I would recommend both of those, uh, the, both of those uh, boatyards, boatyards mm -hmm. for doing the work. Uh, the one on the Mediterranean side, Chantier Alamar, he was, he's, uh, they were family-run business, um, fantastic, like such a professional like bloke. Uh, Puyak, they were good, but not as good as uh, the other place. Henri. Henri. So, but recommend it, but you mm. need to know what you're doing yourself. It's not a question of saying, take my mast off. You have to do all the preparation yourself. You have to label everything yourself. You've got to get everything sorted out beforehand. Yep. That includes, you're obviously building your frame, but you know, loosening your turnbuckles, making sure that everything's greased, taking the split pins out, and then kind of arranging with the, because one of my concerns beforehand was, are they just going to get the mast and put it on the boat? You know, drop it onto the, into the cradle. In both cases, they were happy to leave the mast somewhere for a day or a, or half a day for us to do the work with things like the VHF area and the mm. spreaders. So that was a concern of mine. It was unfounded to, to be concerned about that. Mm. Carrying the mast, the overhang, you need, a, you need buckets on both ends. You do need buckets. Um, what we did is we took, um, in one case, we bought two buckets and knitted them to sliced a bit out of both and then knitted them together with cable ties to make a very kind of oval shaped bucket in profile because it wouldn't fit over the uh, over the the top end of the mast everything was taken off that mast um so all the all the equipment at the, the mast head so lights vhf aerials tv antennas we also um after advice took took all the took the spreaders off took the shrouds off um took the shrouds off the spreaders and cable tied them into coils and put them in the fore cabin. And one thing that I would say is that you see some people carrying the the furler um, and the furling drum with the furling drum over the end of the mast. I wouldn't do that. Uh, we 
completely disconnected ours and slid it along so that the mast foot was the first thing that was um, that could uh, that was that was that would impact mm. if we were to impact, because the problem is that you know if you've got a foil attached to your um, attached to your foil stay. Um, for a furling mechanism, for so, 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 so kind of a, for the, the luff groove to go in for the, the foresail, if you bend that, it's done. And if so, the, you know, wire will bend, but your the, the foil of your forestay, when it's bent, you, you know, you've got a problem. So we slid that all back about a foot, so that the furling mechanism was a foot behind the, yeah. the, 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 the you know the, the further for, the foremost part of the mast. Yeah. Um, aside from that, the cradles. It literally, it's just a logistical job you have to do with um, the shape of your own boat. It's not difficult, it's a couple of days work. Um, we found, you know, we there's a few people on the internet when we did that saying, why aren't you using a Japanese skill saw? <laughs> and I'm like, mate, like in, in the one week that we were given to prepare this, we had to find uh, a, bri a bricolage. And in small towns, yeah. you're not, you know, you don't have a Lowe's or a Home Depot. You are literally going into a place the size of this boat and seeing what they've got. Yeah, and we so, only have our own two feet. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's only so far we can roam to find uh, the, the bits that we need. What I would say is that a lot of people that we did, the, when they did this, the research on this said that if you know you're going to do this and you're going from your own home, build the frame before you leave. Mm. So you've got all the tools. However, even disassembled, that frame took up a lot of space on deck. Mm. So it's not difficult to build. You need a saw, you need some basic tools and a drill and, and you know, some coach bolts and wood. Lots of string, lots of uh, cargo straps as well. Um, those things were an absolute boon because you can really tension them up against bracing points on the, on the deck. And so um, don't just use lines yeah use you can't get them you can't get them so yeah. you use cargo straps fore and aft um and to port and starboard you know so that there's no movement in that thing at all and that to us i think was one of the biggest hints and tips i could give you go and buy 10 12 cargo straps because you they're so versatile mm. you know if two frames i think we had four four cargo straps on each frame and then a couple just tying the, the entire mast down so yeah, that's that's pretty my hints and tips from it. There's no point in going through the actual design of our frame because it's so individual to every boat. Mm. Yeah, we did um, obviously make an episode about our entire preparation, yeah. um, which I would have already linked to up the top again. Um, okay, so on to the next question, uh, which is from Mark, and he wants to know whether it's similar to England, where people live on their boats uh, along the canals. And the short answer is yes, there's a lot of people who live on their canal boats or barges um, on the French canal system. And, uh, you know, we got, we, we had some information about how much that would cost and it's a lot less than uh, m most marinas, uh, on, yep. you know, in both in England, in fact, everywhere that we've been. So it, it can be a relatively cost effective way of living on the water, if that is what you want to do. And the barges... I think a much better set up for living oh, on they're, they're beautiful. than they're the beautiful. sailing boat. So basically we looked at a couple of 55 foot barges just as potential liver boards for some kind of spurious fantasy that we had for the future. <laughs> so 50, you know, various p mooring costs, we got between a thousand and three thousand euros a year uh, for mooring, depending mm. on where you were. Bear in mind though that the Canal de Garonne and the Canal de Midi are closed, or they were closed last year for three or four months. Yeah. Um, for maintenance during winter and because the weather was bad. But I presume they didn't kick everyone off the canal. No, they don't kick them off, but you can't move. You can't move. So you're no. static. Yeah. And we talked to a few people, the damp, obviously in the midwinter on a canal, there's yeah. a lot of damp there. Yeah. So it really, I think you've got to be fairly hardcore to do that, um, you know, 12 months of the year in France. Yeah. That being said, we, we came across quite a few communities. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I know expats, not... English, lots of English people. Yeah. Uh, lots of French people, of lots course. Lots of Australians. Yeah, weirdly, a lot of Australians that I didn't think that most Australians would be able to pick out the Canal du Midi on a map, let <laughs> alone kind of go there and live there on their boats, but I was wrong. Okay, so on to the next question. Um, again, uh, Jose and Glenn both had a uh, very similar question, so I've amalgamated them into the one. Sorry about the creaking behind us, by the way, if you can hear that. It's just one of our lines. It's my knees. <laughs> <laughs> it's my neck every time I turn my head. No, it's just one of our lines creaking. Um, okay, so both of them want to know about renting a canal boat um, to do a holiday on the French canals. 
Um, they're asking about price. I don't know about the price. Actually, or do I? I do we know I, about I the price? I think I do. Yeah. I, well, I, maybe I don't. Yeah. Okay, so I might... I, I think between... There are many, many different types of canal boat you can hire. There are two big companies. One is Le Boat, and the other one is... Loka Boat. Loka Boat. They... Their big selling point um, is that you don't need any license. You haven't got to have any sort of formal qualification to, to rent one of these things mm. or to hire one. Um, and I think they go between about three and six thousand a week. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. euros. And but they'll take ten people, the big yeah. ones. So um, you know, if you if you split it between the help, it's it's, it's cheaper than a ski chalet um, you know, in a very middle class. <laughs> Middle if there are two options, it's cheaper than buying a peacock, and it's twice the expense of, <laughs> of owning my own horse. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving swiftly away from stables, peacocks, uh, <laughs> and chalets, and chalets. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of on par with a uh, with chartering a, another time. Yeah, chartering boat. another yeah. boat in the BBIs or something. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that. Um, it is not often that I see that level of ineptitude um, in any form of boating. Mm. I mean, literally, you could go to like an Australian bucks party, get them all hammered and put them out on a boating lake, absolutely caned, and you'd get better sailors. Caned? Yes. That's a good Australian word that you very rarely say. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So um, we have seen some shenanigans that uh, at one level just warranted a head shake uh, and a tut and another the other end warranted a pickaxe handle to the bracket you know the, the, seriously the level of incompetence was stunning yeah and we talked to a lot of lock keepers on the way and they're like i'm like what is going on literally it's like those scenes where you get the clowns turning up in cars where the wheel falls off and there's one <laughs> kind of hanging off the back with a like a hose pipe you know and the lock keeper was always like, you haven't seen anything. Yeah. The, the, you like, this is nothing. You, like, you wait till August arrives. Yeah. I remember stopping at one lock and the, there was a, a, a chap. He was about 60 with his wife and his mother-in-law or whatever. Mm -hmm. And literally he he hit us three times. And we had we have got fenders galore and they had fenders galore. He was Spanish and I'm in the end just shouting him in Spanish saying, please just be careful. You're going to, you know, you're damaging our boat. And then, he, in the end, I yelled at him so much. I said to the I said to the lock keeper, I said, "Look, because we were all crammed into a lock." Yeah. I said to this lock, this girl, I said, "Please, that he's he doesn't know what he's doing." And she held him back. They actually because we were on a staircase lock, and I think she could see that he was just dangerous. And she said, "Don't worry, we'll we'll just hold him." And then you've got twenty minutes. You've got twenty minutes ahead of him. Yeah, I mean that is the good thing about the canal du Midi about the fact that all the locks are manned is that you do have the canal du Midi. By the way, is I think the busiest canal yeah. in France. Um, but you do have that support there if you need it because um, if you were just in the automated lock and you had a problem person behind you, yeah, but they, they, then there's nothing you can do. They, there's no yeah, one there to they arbitrate. Don't. And we see. I mean, and during this conversation, I said to the lock keeper, "This this is bad," and he said, "You know," and he goes, "Look," he said. This is this sounds like a joke, but he said, "Look, th there's two boats sinking back there, and there's a boat on fire up there." So he goes, "We're having a good day," and the level, the so the the, the biggest worry was not the lock walls; it was other boaters. Uh, we got hit by another boat quite seriously, actually. Some girl who was in her twenties, literally, we could see it happening. We were parked, we were more transversely against the canal, against the dock wall, mm. and she just she she literally got her boat wedged under our mast. Yeah, one instance where our mast overhang was, yeah. was a problem. Um, and I, I went onto the bow and was being impolite. Because mm -hmm. literally I could see the mast. I'm oh, she's going to burn that mast. Yeah. Her excuse was, this isn't my fault. I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm like, all right, well, I said, look, just park your boat up and we'll discuss insurance. And that's what happened. I said, listen, I can't see if you've damaged our mast or not, but when the when we take all the all the protection off if it's damaged i'm gonna I'll, I'll cut through your insurance thankfully nothing happened but at this point you know she's become belligerent she's like there's no damage to your mast you don't know what you're talking about and I, thankfully there were four other boaters and the uh the the the, the owner of the capitale and she said that what she said look madame you did hit their mast so yeah the the biggest problem for us was other boaters and we have been told avoid uh french 
school holidays. School holidays. So that's mid July to uh, through August, um, because it gets crazy there. So apart from other boaters, but you can see them a mile off, literally, because they're like pinballing off the canal, off the, off the, especially the the lock walls now. Mm. But that, yeah, that that was it. So that wraps up part one of our Q and A about the. <laughs> that's my guts. It's me guts. I've eaten something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with me, cats? <laughs> anyway, that wraps up part one of our Q&A for the canal sessions. Come back next time and we're going to be talking about our favourite places, what's to see, what's to do, and would we do it again? Thanks very much for watching. Goodbye.